Our next case is about a young man murdered in his own home in Lancashire late one afternoon in the last week of November. No one seems to know why. It's possible there's a drugs connection, but even that's by no means certain. And detectives are hoping someone watching tonight will tell them in confidence what was going on. John Threlfall was a bright lad who lived with his parents in Bolton Le Sands on the A6 near Morecambe in Lancashire. The family moved into Coniston Road a couple of years ago. John wasn't just a keen sportsman, he was good. In cricket, he'd been selected for the Lancashire schools under 18s. I think he, he had a such a natural, he had he a natural talent. Um, but he wanted to play in the village, he didn't want to go on and his ambitions at first were, I think, to play for England or something, but then he decided just to play for the local team with his friends. He was really a very happy child, and he, he was interested in such a lot of things. But not everything was going right. John seemed to have lost his sense of motivation. He'd enrolled at college to study A-level art, but had dropped out after a few weeks, unhappy with the course. He took to staying in his room all day, undecided about his future. It's known he'd taken some drugs sometime over the summer of last year. It's also known there was a problem playing on his mind, though he wouldn't reveal what it was. Friday, the 29th of November. John's father left for work at 8.20, leaving John alone in the house, along with the family dog. The Threlfalls never locked the door if someone was at home. Just after four that Friday afternoon, John rang his father's office. Good afternoon, more conception. Is Duncan Threll falling? I'm sorry, he's out now. He won't be back until Monday morning. Right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That was the last time John was known to be alive. People remember several strangers near John's house over the next two hours. Police are anxious to eliminate them from the inquiry. The first two appeared separately at the Mogul Jubilee garage on the A6 about 400 yards from John's home in Coniston Road. It's 4.30 p.m. on Friday, November the 29th. Do you know where Coniston Road is? Yes. Um, now, let me see. Are you facing this way? Was this yes, you, or do you know who it was? Police know of no one in Coniston Road who was expecting or received a visitor that night. She was about five foot five inches tall, had mousy hair, permed into a bubble coat that went from short to long, and was in her early thirties. Turn up to your left, and that is Coniston Road. Thank you very much. After directing her, she seemed as if she was in a mood or an argument with somebody and said, thank you very much, in a hasty way. About half an hour later, Pauline received another visitor. Can I help you? Can you direct me to Coniston Road? Yes. Um, if you go back along the main... He road, was uh, in his late 20s, early 30s. He had very dark brown hair and moustache. He was dressed in an evening suit. He was so um, well-dressed and immaculate. Um, I took it that he worked at either one of the local night spots or that he was going out for an evening out to a dinner or something. Police are also eager to trace a man who was seen running down the A6 away from the direction of John's house. Trevor Norris, a local joiner, was on his way home. As I got to the junction with Slyne Road, I saw a lad running very fast on the left-hand side. The lad looked to be in his early 20s and was about 5 foot 10 to 6 foot high and his hair was light brown in colour. 
John had arranged to meet a friend at Lancaster Station early that evening. The two were going to get the 5.45 to Manchester to see John's brother. But the friend, Graham Nightingale, waited there in vain. Around the time John was due at Lancaster Station, his neighbour saw two people outside the Threlfall's house. Were they the strangers from the garage? Graham Nightingale gave up waiting for his friend at around the time John's father arrived home from work. Unusually, the house was in darkness. John? John was dead. He'd been beaten up and strangled. I'd just like to make an appeal for anybody at all who knows anything about John's death to come forward because until we realise the reason why this has happened, it just is uh, keeping us all in, in not we can't explain in a limbo. We just don't uh, cannot relate to it at all and. Um, I just can't understand why anybody would have done it to John. Graham Gooch, that's the problem. You can't understand why anybody would have done it either, and obviously that's the major point of appeal tonight. Well, that's right. We're short of a motive. We don't know why. There's been speculation about drugs, but we really can't be certain, and we need to know why he died. Now, apart from the people that we saw in that film, and you need those people to come forward and eliminate themselves, yes. or others to identify them, there was a, a, the sighting of a man near John's house. Well, that's right. A couple of hundred yards away, there's a level crossing across the main London Scotland railway line. Now, a man was seen there at about 4.30 on that evening. He was about six feet tall, and he had brown hair, which appeared to have light streaks in it. He was wearing a tan, three-quarter length trench coat, and was carrying a large tan holdall or sports bag. And we'd like, to, we'd like to speak to that man. So, again, if that was you, or you know who it might have been, do please call us. The date again, Friday the 29th of November. We're talking about the late afternoon, early evening. A couple of cars too. One right outside John's home, another one just down the street. Yes, the one just down the street was a, a light-coloured Ford Orion motor car. That was seen at the, in the rear car park of Bolton Sands Fire Station, which isn't normally manned. Um, a young man, possibly in his 20s, was seen sitting in the car and appeared to be reading something, possibly a map. Now, one thing about that is that if he was going to consult a map, he could, there was plenty of room for him to just pull onto the forecourt. So why was he in the rear car park? Now, that car park overlooks the back gardens of Coniston Road. So that man may have seen something at that time. Even if he didn't, you want him to call in, presumably? Yes, we certainly do, yeah. And the car outside the Threlfall's house? Yes, outside the Threlfall's house um, was a white hatchback-type car, possibly an XR2, like the one you can see, or a three of that, that sort of vehicle. None of the neighbours can account for it as being theirs or belonging to visitors. And the one thing we do know, it wasn't there when Mr. Threlfall Senior came home at 10 to 6. So again, this is largely a matter of elimination, probably, but you never know. The man uh, seen running down the A6, there were several witnesses to that, weren't there? That's right. Um, we've had four witnesses come forward who have seen him, probably the same man, and he was seen running. They all say the same thing. He was running very fast, not just jogging, but really running fast. He was seen near to John's house by the little chef and then down as far as Slyne Road. Now that young man, um, his late teens, early twenties, and he's got dark hair. He was wearing a grey crew neck top and dark trousers. Supposing he had nothing to do with this murder but was just uh, running away from something else, perhaps a very minor offence that he shouldn't have been involved with and he rings up. I mean, he, mi he might be quite ca cautious about calling you. Well, that's right, but I'm really interested in the murder and, and, and nothing else. And if he has nothing to do with it, I'd like him to come forward because I've got an awful lot of people looking for him and we need, we don't want to waste time on it. Okay, there's a reward for this, isn't there? There is. The Community Action Trust are putting up a reward of £5,000 for information leading to the arrest and charge of the persons who killed John Threlfall. I think it's the biggest award uh, they've ever put up. Uh, it's very rarely that people do call Crime Watch uh, in order to get a reward. If you can help with this in any way, if you knew John Threlfall, if you've got anything that you can 
help us with that will cast light on the motive for this killing, do call 081-811-8181. That's 081-811-8181. Or you can call uh, the detectives, colleagues of Graham Gooch, who are back at the incident room. That's 0772 61 That's 0772, that's the code for Preston, 61 Our first reconstruction tonight is the murder of a little girl more than 16 years ago. It's a case that has shocked the nation twice. In October 1975, 11-year-old Leslie Moleseed was murdered on her way to the local shop. And for some time afterwards, parents everywhere thought twice before letting young children go out alone. Then, last month, came the second shock. Stefan Kishko, the man convicted of murder eight years ago, was cleared by the Court of Appeal. He'd spent 16 years in jail for a crime he couldn't possibly have committed. So now the investigation into the murder of Leslie Moleseed has reopened. Key witnesses from 1975 have helped us to make this reconstruction. We hear the voice of Leslie's mother, April, but an actress takes her part. With your help tonight, perhaps it's not too late to see justice finally take its proper course. Our film begins in Rochdale in Lancashire on Sunday, October the 5th, 1975. She loved her music. She liked to be a city roller, so that was her passion. She used to run around with a tat and scarf tied round her arm, you know, and be city rollers stocking and whatnot. And, and her sister used to argue a lot because she was always pinching her, her sister Laura's be city roller posters and just a rough tumble little girl she was. It's just it's, she was exceptionally small. That was all. She looked very delicate, very small. She had open heart surgery when she was about three, which she came through with flying colours. Everybody knew Leslie. She really was a lovely little girl. Leslie lived with her mother, stepfather, and elder brother and sister on the Turf Hill estate in Rochdale. It's Sunday, the 5th of October, 1975. And a very nice record that they've suggested is this one. Leslie? Yeah? Just pop in here a sec, please. Yeah? You just got the shop for me. I only want to look at bread. I want an air freshener way there. OK. Oh, I've been in a minute. Bye. The local spa shop was in Anstell Road, a ten-minute walk away. Where are you going? I went to the shops. Do you want anything? No, thanks. Bernadette Hegarty was 10 years old at the time and lived on the same estate. I've known Leslie since we were small. We used to play together. She only lived a couple of doors away. As she was going to the shop that day, I was walking up behind her. We didn't walk up together because we'd fell out at the youth club on Friday over a maxi dress. So Leslie went off up the lane and I went round the other way. Leslie was never seen again by anyone who knew her. The shopkeeper couldn't be sure that she ever reached the shop. An hour later, a few roads away from the Moleseeds' house, Emma Tong was waiting for her son, who'd arranged to take her out for the afternoon. Through the window, I saw this car with a child sat in the front. A man in his 30s with thinning, fluffy brown hair got into the car. It was a dirty, like a beige colour, with the uh, red round, as though it was ready for uh, respraying. I saw that uh, poster of the little girl when I was going in town. And I thought, hey, I'm sure that's that little girl I saw in that car in, outside of my house, you know. 
By half past one, Leslie had been gone more than an hour. Laura went to look for her. About 20 minutes' drive from Rochdale is the A672, linking the M62 with Halifax. At about 3.30 that Sunday afternoon, Christopher Coverdale saw something that struck him as odd. As I came around this particular corner, I saw a man and a young girl on the skyline. He was quite a large chap, portly, receding airline. On a cold, misty October afternoon, it was strange for anyone to want to go walking on the moors. At dusk, just over two hours later, Sandra Chapman and her husband were driving past the same spot. There was a white car in the lay-by and it had all this red primer on it. And I took particular notice because it was parked very tightly in the corner and there was no one in around. Three days later, Leslie's body was found just a few yards from the lay-by. She'd been stabbed repeatedly. Time doesn't. Well, perhaps tonight, Trevor Wilkinson, someone can help find who did kill Leslie and right that terrible miscarriage of justice. That's right, Sue. West Yorkshire Police last year having un uncovered the evidence that clearly showed that Stephen Kisco was not the murderer of Leslie Molseed, we began re-evaluating the evidence that was gathered in 1975. That evidence revealed very striking similarities between the sightings of Emma Tong and Christopher Coverdale. That last sighting of Christopher Coverdale was within yards of where Leslie's body was eventually recovered. What exactly are those similarities that were striking? In both sightings, the man was, in 1975, believed to be in his 30s. He was wearing a dark brown jacket, lighter coloured trousers, and a light coloured cardigan underneath the jacket. The child's clothing in both sightings was identical to that worn by Leslie. What must now be remembered is that that man would be in his late 40s or in his early 50s mm. now. And how many people do you have who seem to have seen that white car with the red primer around it? Apart from the sighting in the lay that has been shown tonight, there is three sightings in Wellath Lane near Mrs Tong's house. Two of those other sightings, the people are convinced that it was a Vauxhall Viva. One of the people who saw it believe, and he is from the motor trade, believes that it was a 1965 model and that would mean that it could possibly be on a D plate at that time. Mm. Now on that afternoon there was another sighting in that lay-by, it's October the 5th, which could be very significant. As we passed this lay-by we saw this ex-GPO van, horrible painted colour, and I just turned around to the door and said, oh look at the colour of that ruddy thing. Just seeing the van parked there with the rug, you know, all around the windows, it, I think made us uh, I think that probably somebody was courting. Now, how important do you think that could be to you? It's a very important sighting. Mr Jones says that that sighting and that colour of the vehicle is the best one he has seen since 1975. That vehicle we know had been in the library or visited on several occasions between 2pm and 6pm on that afternoon. It may not be connected with the murder, but it might be somebody who actually was there for other reasons that they couldn't come forward in 1975 who might have seen something very relevant. There was 8,000 inquiries to try and trace that vehicle. It wasn't traced. We asked that person to come forward now who owned the vehicle who might have seen something. We realised that all the sightings we're asking people to put together, the man, the vehicle and that vehicle, are 16 years old. But what has been impressed us is the clarity of the memory of people who have come forward since 1975. We actually believe that in 1975 there was a member of the public, and a viewer tonight probably, who had suspicions about a member of the family, a neighbour, a friend, a work associate. And now, since 1975, they may have re-offended. They may have come to notice of the police. They may even be in prison now or have served a prison sentence. We want them to come forward and tell us about that person. They may have been very anxious when the body of Leslie was on the moors that day, that time between the 5th and 8th of uh, October 1975. They would have, that anxiety would have been relieved when Mr Kisco was arrested and eventually convicted. When his appeal was become successful, that anxiety may have returned. We need that phone call. The nightmare that has revisited the Mulsey family twice in 16 years needs to be laid to rest. We want a phone call that will give us a key that unlocks this case and finishes their anguish forever, and also Mr Kisco's. And this is the number, if you can help, 081 811 8181 here to the studio, or you can contact Bradford Police Station direct. That number is 0800 212 392. That's a free phone number, 0800 212 293. 
Somewhere in the east of England, two small-time robbers have been engaged in a partnership that's led so far to at least two violent deaths. You may recall a murder reconstruction we did three months ago in Lincolnshire, where Fred Maltby was robbed and battered in his home. Fred Maltby was a quiet and self-contained man whose home was in a village just south of Lincoln. He'd lived in this farm cottage for 40 years and seldom ventured far afield. Property developers had once offered him half a million pounds for his 15-acre smallholding, and it's possible someone thought Fred was better off than he really was. On Tuesday, the 1st of October last year, at 9.45 p.m., a witness was driving home past Fred's house when he had to swerve to avoid two men running across the street. They were last seen heading towards a local housing estate on Larn Road. Since then, another man, Joe Rylett, has been killed, and the detective in charge of the case, Superintendent Stuart Clifton, has now linked the two inquiries. The victims lived about two miles apart. Both were retired, both were thought to keep cash on the premises, both were attacked on Tuesday evenings, and both were killed in the same way. Joe Rylatt was divorced and lived alone in a flat above one of the two betting shops he'd started up in Lincoln. One of the shops was managed by his son, Eddie, and Alan had now more or less retired. He was shy but charming, fond of poetry, of music and of golf. And though he could be tough in business, among his friends he had a reputation for generosity sometimes making loans of several thousand pounds. If your hands are apart, then you'll, then you'll slice it for sure, OK? Oh. Twice a week or so, Joe would walk just round the corner to St Botolph's Court, which is sheltered accommodation for old people. His mum has lived here for several years. Ah, oh, Joe. The last time she was to see him was the night he died, Tuesday the 28th of January. He was with her till around 8.30. Oh. Meanwhile, opposite Joe's shop in High Street, a security guard noticed someone waiting. There may be nothing sinister in this, but a man was sitting in a red or orange C-registered Astra. Do you know who it was? He honked the horn and waved at someone. At about 8.25, another witness came across another car in Bargate. I noticed a brown escort car, and I saw a man stood at the driver's side door uh, with fair to mousy coloured hair, about 5 foot 10, 5 11 tall, with uh, green mountain boots or Wellingtons on. She's asleep now. Before he left, Joe saw his mother's care assistant. She was the last person known to have seen him before he died. You're off now, then? Yeah, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a major round thing to eat. No, oh, that's all right. I'm just going for a, a while. I'll be back about ten. I'll make her something, then. Oh, OK. Thank there you, you go. Thank you. Congratulations, Ford. And which... Someone else, though, was to speak to Joe that night. A friend who placed a flutter with him now and then. Two programmes when Ian... Returns from the England tour. Hello, Alan. It's Mike. Yeah, fine, fine. Yeah, I'm dogging it tonight. Yes, yes. Oxford, if that's okay. One, two, nine o'clock on. 50p reverse. Oh, I've got you a bad time, have I? Yeah, okay, bye. Bye. It wasn't a normal Alan. Mike telephone conversation in the sense that he was a little more hurried. Uh, there was noises in the background, which I heard distinctly, uh, i.e. banging uh, and also uh, voices and a little bit of laughter. Then at 10 to 9, I was walking down Bargate past Rylett's bookmakers and I saw a bloke crouch down in the side entrance. He was wearing a suede jacket maybe leather. Did you see someone here as well? Upstairs, Joe had been preparing sandwiches. 
Clearly something, or someone, had interrupted him. About 50 minutes later, another witness was crossing High Street, just opposite Joe Rylett's shop. And this woman saw them a little further down the road. I passed these two youths that were running wildly. They ran up St Catherine's. They had to run into the road to avoid two old ladies, and a car beeped to them. I had to stop at the traffic lights. When they got towards the lights, they shot out into the road. Again, a car had to sound his horn and avoid them. I passed them just going past the St Catherine's garage on Newark Road and that was the last time I saw them. Did you also see them? Or were you in one of the cars that swerved out to avoid them? Joe Rylat's safe was open. £3,000 was missing. Next morning, when Joe's son, Eddie, arrived to open up the shop, he found his father lying dead with severe wounds to his head. Stuart Clifton, murder is, is rare. For a man to kill twice successively is very rare, but for two men to kill in successive episodes, is, it's almost unheard of. It's certainly unheard of in, in Lincolnshire. Two murders that are so similar in the space of four months causes me to worry a great deal. I'm worried that this may develop into yet another murder, may develop into a serial killing. Because of that, uh, I'm using Crime Watch to appeal to the public of Lincoln. I believe that there are two people concerned in these murders, that perhaps only one has done the killing, and perhaps the second one has felt the need to tell somebody about it. Tonight, I appeal to that person to come forward and contact me through Crime Watch so that we can prevent another tragedy occurring. You think it's as serious as that? I do believe that there is the potential for another murder. I'm quite hopeful that someone in Lincoln will take the time and trouble tonight to ring us in the studio so that we can uh, prevent yet another serious incident occurring. Now, they make quite an odd couple, these two, don't they? Yes, they do. The, the, one, one is rather large, a little over six foot, and the other's quite small. The, uh, the bigger of the two is described as a skinny build. He's got mousy coloured hair and he wore a corduroy coat, something similar to this. And one of the points of appeal I'd like to get over tonight is if anybody in the city of Lincoln knows anyone who fits the description that I've just given, who wears a coat of this type, then I would encourage them to ring me urgently in the studio tonight. They don't have to give their name. The smaller guy was wearing uh, distinctive clothing too in, the, in as much as white, vivid white shoes, trainers or something. Yes, the smaller man had a bomber jacket on. He's about five foot six with dark hair, again in his mid-twenties. He had uh, dark trousers and white training shoes, which looked as if they may be in new condition. Now, obviously, people living in Lincoln uh, are going to be fairly concerned about what you've said. Perhaps we should make it clear that they seem to be, firstly, acting uh, only at quite long distances in time, one from another, secondly, going for quite specific targets. But perhaps there are also things that people can do to protect themselves. Well, yes, of course. Clearly, there are two people in Lincoln who are prepared to commit murder. We know that one is tall and one is, is quite short. If people are visiting, and they fit that general description, then obviously the public must be, aw be aware of that. Um, I would not encourage anybody to, to let people into their houses uh, unless they're quite sure of the people that they've got at their door. And if people have got suspicions about somebody who might be the killer, you suspect that person will have what characteristics that people might recognise apart from being or yes, I, I'm fairly confident that there will be one dominant personality in this, one killer perhaps. And that killer will be known in the city of Lincoln for his extreme violence. So I'd appeal for people in, in the city of Lincoln who know people that fit this description and who do show these violent traits to contact us here in the studio tonight. Well, please ring straight away. The urgency is pretty self-evident. 081-811-8181. If somebody has told you anything in confidence or you've strong suspicions, don't let this go any further, please. 081-811-8181. Or try the incident room in Lincoln itself. 0522. That's 532222. Two, two. 
0522 532222. How do you find three calculating killers when all you have to go on is some fairly vague descriptions? Well, the answer is see if something clicks with someone watching Crime Watch. What we do know is the men may well come from South London. They're probably in their late 30s, and they seem to have access to a well-kept white Orion car. Their victim was Nimal Samarasena, often known as Sam, who lived in Wallington in Surrey with his daughter Michelle and his wife Florence. Sam worked for a helicopter company in Surrey as a licensed avionics engineer, maintaining and repairing airborne electronics. He frequently worked evenings and Saturdays and Sundays. What are you watching? Just something on the TV. And... Come on. Dad. Come on, you learned something. Okay. Come on. Sam enjoyed as much time as possible with Michelle, his only child. He'd spent several years working abroad, and now he was home for good. She was the centre of his life. See, it's a bit tricky, isn't yeah. it? He used to come at weekends with his daughter Michelle. You can always tell where they were and everything like that. There's always laughter wherever they went. Anybody could, could talk to him. We could, if anybody had a problem, they could always talk to Sam. The night of Wednesday, January the 22nd, midnight. Hey, what's going on? I just saw this bloke run off over there. Are you all right? I saw your door open. Yeah, yeah, of course we're all right. I'm just trying to get some sleep, that's all. Well, I'm just a neighbor trying to help you out. All right. Okay, okay. Cheers. It's all right. Yes. Police. I don't know. It might not be important, but something rather strange has just happened. The police could find no sign of forced entry and failed to trace the helpful neighbor. Was it you? Then, next day... I was taking my dog for his usual morning walk, which was around about quarter past seven. And as I was going along the main road, I was aware of this white car that was coming towards me. And then it, it stopped across the junction and then turned into Carew Road. I went across the road as I normally do, and then it, it backed across the, the main road and up Band and Rise, and the whole thing just seemed very, very peculiar to me. I became aware that the driver was Asian, and as was the passenger. And then it just halted. A few days later, Nimal, worried by the strange incident on his doorstep, installed an alarm system and a dummy security camera. The last day of Nimal Samarasena's life. 6.45 a.m. on Thursday, the 30th of January. As I crossed the road, but I noticed uh, a white Orion. It's in exceptionally good condition, very clean. But the windows on it were not frosted. As I looked inside the car, I see a chubby Asian guy, probably 40, 45 years of age, with a load of hair pushed back off his face, very bushy, uh, and he had a big, sort of, puffed-up beige jacket he was wearing. Do you know who this was? He had a perfect view of the front and garage entrances to Nemal's house. I was scraping the ice off of my car 
and just happened to look across the road and there was a white Ford Orion in there and a man sitting in it was the driver's window down. He looked about 35, thin face, thin nose and a flat cap just looking across towards the main road. I felt that there was somebody looking at me and I just happened to look round and he was looking across at me and started the engine of the car up, drove to the end of the turning and turned right until he was out of view. Where's your shampoo, Michelle? Upstairs, yours, Dad. I was walking down towards the mains road and I heard a loud noise which sounded like metal against metal. And I looked across and I saw a man standing on the inside of the gate looking up towards the garages. Niamel Samarasino was killed by a single powerful knife blow to his heart. It had the hallmarks of a paid assassination. There's a reward, a very big reward indeed. If you can help to prove who did it, if you've heard any gossip, if you can help identify or eliminate any of the people in the White Orion, do please call right away 081 811 8181. Or perhaps you know who this is. He was seen in an alley behind the shops in Stafford Road, just round the corner from Nimel's house. It was then about 8.45 a.m. The date again, Thursday the 30th of January. The number again, 081 811 8181. Or you can call Wallington Police Station in Surrey on 081 669 2214. That's 081 669 2214. Now for this month's final reconstruction. Tracy Mead was 14 when she died. Why anyone should stab her is a mystery, and it's proving just as hard unravelling the last days of her life. It's in a tower block off the Harrow Road in London, near an area called Little Venice, but Tracy often spent the night with relatives not far away in Kensal Rise. Tracy had been playing truant, in fact she'd barely been to school for months, and used to sit around with friends or wander through the streets of northwest London. Our reconstruction features actresses, but Tracy's real mother and other witnesses have also taken part. Hi, good evening. Can I help you at all? Yeah, I've come about my daughter. I'm really worried. I think she's gone missing. What's your daughter's name, please? It's Tracy Mead. And how old is Tracy? She's 14. She's never done anything like this before. When was the last time you saw Tracy? It's a Monday evening. She spent the day up her nan's, that's 65 Lothrop Street. Her mates often went round there to call for her. One of her friends had called on her the afternoon she disappeared. Oh, all right. I'm coming out. No, I can't. I've got to take Tanya down to Mum's later. So. Well, you're staying down there tonight. No, I'm going to come back here later. Well, Tracy showed no sign that she planned anything unusual. That's at Droop Street. All right, then. So if I'm not Tracy was my best friend for about a year. She always had a happy smile on her face and was always joking and laughing about. We never really used to do much when we went out, except go in each other's houses, watch videos or listen to music. Tracy said she'd not back for me that night, but she never did, and that was the last time I see her. Around half past five, Tracy took her younger sister, Tanya,
from their nan's house back to the Warwick estate to their mother's flat. We're a pretty close family and Tracy used to like staying at my sister's and my mum's and uh, she never did like my flat because we're stuck on the sixth floor. Mmm, that's lovely. That night she just seemed her normal self, like nothing different about her or not moody or anything like that. It was, you know, just, just her plain self like she normally is every day. Um, Mum, I'm going to go into school tomorrow, so can I have some bus fare, please? Oh, this is costing me a fortune. In fact, as usual, Tracy didn't go to school next day, and so far as is known, when she disappeared, she only had her bus fare to her name. Being the parent of a teenager, you've got to trust them. That's what I did with Tracy. I trusted her. I don't know what went wrong. Right, what are you doing tonight? Um, I'm going to go and stay at Auntie Jackie's tonight. But I found out earlier today that she hadn't gone up my sister's that night, like she said, and she hadn't gone to school the next day either. I'm really worried. Well, but let's get all the details down for a missing persons report. Kim Mead wasn't satisfied that the police were acting with sufficient urgency. And three days after she'd last seen Tracy, she began to go searching through the neighbourhood in her own attempt to find out what had happened. Have you seen her? Um, no. I went round all Tracy's friends and people who knew her. And then when I got back, I heard that a young girl had seen her on the Wednesday, the day I reported her missing. She said she saw Tracy underneath the Hapley Steps bridge near the Harrow Road, rowing with a boy who was a bit taller than Tracy and had fair hair. The bridge isn't far from where my mum lives. Nearly two weeks after Tracy disappeared, a girl much like her was seen some three miles from her home. Yeah, we'll keep going down that way. We'll have to be in Shepherd's Bush. No, you're going towards Acton up there. What are you looking for? Adam's Cafe. Adam's? Yeah. Have you looked in the market? Oh, I'm not sure where it is. Well, there's loads of cafes up there. I'm walking up that way. Do you want to walk up there with me? Yeah, OK, then. OK, yeah. come on. I'm supposed to be meeting my boyfriend and his mates in Adam's Cafe. Right, well, there's loads of cafes down there. I should start working your way around the outside. OK, then. Thanks for your help. All right, I hope you find him. If this wasn't Tracy, and you know who it might have been, do call us so that she could be eliminated from the inquiry. Three hours later, at half past four on Friday the 31st of January, two girls went into a cafe on the Goldhawk Road. Again, do you know who they were? Hey, do you fancy my mash? Yeah, oh, I love it. I do remember the two girls coming in. They looked as though they'd been sleeping rough. They was very clean and tidy, but very tired. The um, young girl who ordered the pie mash had uh, black bobbed hair. She was very pretty looking, but also very young looking. The girl with blonde hair had something stuffed under her jacket, but I don't know what it was. Next afternoon, on Saturday the 1st of February, Tracy's body was recovered from the Grand Union Canal near Kensal Rise. Tracy had drowned, quite recently, after being stabbed. Colin Wright, what do you think happened? Tracy was a streetwise kid. Uh, she had lots and lots of friends. I believe she went to that canal with somebody who she knew. One person or perhaps a group of people? No, I believe she would have gone there with a group. She was that sort of girl who surrounded herself with lots of friends. Are you suggesting this wasn't a premeditated murder or even a, a spontaneous, deliberate attack, but maybe a prank that went it's wrong? It's my own what? personal opinion, Nick, that uh, she went there with a group of friends and uh, things led on, and unfortunately, Tracy ended in the canal. She was stabbed, but drowned. Now, the stab wounds were relatively superficial, weren't they? I mean, she either was pushed or, or stumbled into the That into could the be. Canal. You will we'll never know. It looked as though it was a sex attack, I gather. I mean, as though there was some 
sexual motive in, in as much as some of her clothes were found in one location and, and some in another and she was only partly clothed. She was partially water. clothed when she was found in the canal. I believe that was probably the motive. Uh, I believe that she may have gone there with a group of uh, other children and uh, things uh, progressed far more than she expected. Now, you're suggesting there are going to be several kids who live in that area who know what happened or have heard gossip or heard talk about it. I'm almost sure my intuition leads me to believe that there's children out there, some of them may be close friends, who know just what went on that night. They may be very worried about ringing in, frankly. They may well be, but I can assure the, them that uh, I, will I will treat them with discretion, I will treat them fairly, but I need to speak to them because they hold the clue to this murder. You think you're going to find the answer in time from, from friends of hers, from, from people? Do you think it's going to come out, if not tonight, eventually you'll find out how this happened? There are some people out there who must be worrying about this at the moment, and I know eventually one of them will come forward. I would prefer that to be now rather than later. Now, there's this missing two weeks in Tracy's life. Uh, there she was saying that she'd be with her her nan, uh, that was about middle of January, and then she wasn't found until the very end of January, for the first day of, of February. You've no idea where she was at that time? There's no suggestion, Nick, that uh, she was kidnapped. She went away of her own volition. She wasn't distressed or upset. She was around the Harrow Road and Paddington area, and she'd been seen on a number of occasions. Uh, so she know, we know she was living somewhere, but where that was, we've not found out. Wherever she was staying, she might have left uh, a T-shirt like this, because this is the T-shirt she was wearing when she, she left home. That was a T-shirt, a similar T-shirt to this, a little bit darker. Not the looking. one that she was uh, found with when, when she died. That's right. Now, what about all these sightings of people? Are they red herrings? Do you want people to come forward and say, that was me, you can eliminate me from this inquiry, or, or are you pretty sure that they really were Tracy? We're not too sure, and I don't think we will be sure until those people come forward. But the descriptions are so similar, we'd obviously like to trace those people, uh, especially the uh, young girl with the bob-type haircut who was seen in the pie mash shop. Oh, well. There, there she is. I mean, if that was you and you had nothing to do with Tracy, don't know her, please ring us. If you do know Tracy, that was you, do please ring us. There was a, a boy, of course, uh, seen uh, with her arguing, it seemed, under a bridge. Again, just could have been a friend of hers. That's, that's right, yes. Just under the apony steps there, a young boy aged about 16, blondish hair with a white baseball cap. Now, I'd like him to come forward because that could also save us a lot of time. OK, well, if you know anything about this whatsoever, do please call us now. Remember, you can speak to a BBC researcher if you want, rather than to a police officer. The number's there, 081 811 8181. Or you can call the Kensington Incident Room on 071 937 7945. 071 937 7945. John Shippey was almost everyone's good friend, it seems. Generous, gregarious and though no one knew where it had come from, he had plenty of money. He relished popularity. He had lots of friends and lots of girlfriends. But clearly not everyone was so impressed by Mr Shippey. Someone decided to kill him. And maybe in the next ten minutes after this reconstruction, we'll discover who they are and why they did it. Doves is in South Croydon, Surrey. And after working there for almost quarter of a century, John Shippey had risen from a junior in the accounts department to become the finance director. Since his death, the business has discovered that about three quarters of a million pounds has been siphoned from their subsidiary finance company over a period of at least eight years. I'm going to the cricketers. Then I'm going to get some agreements signed. OK, have a nice weekend. You too, darling. Bye. I'd known John for nearly eight years, ever since I joined the company. He was a big man. He had lots of presence. You always knew when he was in a room. If you had a problem and you asked him to solve your problem, he'd always try to do it. His local was the cricketers and um, he had used the pub for many many years for both business and for pleasure John was a very outgoing man <laughs> 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 
Oh, that's the lad. <laughs> <laughs> that's in the pub in the cricketers. Oh, all right, John. <laughs> now then, what's this about Friday? Everybody all right for it? Yeah, that's yeah. all right. John lived his life in thousands of little compartments. And you didn't really cross over from one to the other unless he really allowed you to. <laughs> all right, lads, who's up for snacking? He was a completely larger than life character. A very kind, generous man. And just good fun to be with. <laughs> I just cannot think of any reason at all why anyone would want to do any harm to John at all. The night of Saturday, the 14th of December, 1991. John and one of his girlfriends, Carol, had dinner with Joe Kavanagh and his wife at a local restaurant. <laughs> You sure you don't want to drink, John? No, no, no. I'm knocking it on the head until after Christmas. Have you told him about the new boat? Mm -mm. No. Got it? Yeah. Mm. Where'd you get the white one? Yeah, 40 footer. Are you ready for Spain in May? Mm. Yeah. Is everything all right? Great. Yeah. As usual, Osman, since it's Christmas, why don't you take a photograph? Give me the camera. Here you are. Mm. Mm. Here you go. The four of them left the restaurant at about one o'clock and John drove Carol to the house he'd helped her buy in Item in Kent. Although he owned a number of homes, he spent much of his time here and would normally stay with Carol at the weekend. But theirs was a volatile relationship, and that night they had a sudden row. John left the house between two and three in the morning in his blue Ford Sierra Sapphire. It wasn't until three days later that Carol realized something might be wrong. Hello? Hi, Carol. Oh, hello, Joe. How are you? All right, thanks. You haven't seen John at all, have you? He hasn't been down the cricketers for a couple of days now. No, I haven't seen him since Saturday. In fact, I've had doves on the phone saying he missed an important meeting yesterday. It's not like him at all. I'm beginning to get quite worried. 20 miles west of Item, the M25 crosses the M23 near the village of Merstham. Later that night, a witness was approaching the village on his way back from a badminton match. I was driving along Rockshaw Road uh, towards Warwick's Wold, and um, I became aware of a car in front who was driving erratically. Uh, the driver and a passenger were looking in both directions and became nervous when I came up behind them. The moment I overtook them and went to look in and see exactly who was in the car, um, they both deliberately turned away, so I really only had a look at the back of their heads. The small network of roads next to the motorway is usually quiet, leading only to a scattering of private houses or to a nearby gypsy camp. Yet at 10 to 11, another witness saw something there that struck him as peculiar. As I passed the junction of Rockshaw Road and continued down towards Warwick's Road, there were two cars parked on the near side. The car I came to first was a Ford Cortina and the car in front of that was a blue Ford Sierra with a man leaning into the back of the passenger compartment and uh, as I passed them I picked up the headlights in the mirror of the car which uh, I thought was odd if one of the cars had broken down that both of them had got their headlights on. Just down the road a couple was watching Newsnight. Oh my God, what was that? I don't know. like I come from the motorway. But you stay here, I'll have a look. No, no, I'll come with you. Having picked my wife up and entered Warwick's world again, there was a blue Sierra which was completely engulfed in flames. And I thought at the time that was the car that I'd just seen previously and passed about 20 minutes earlier. Fine rescue. Yeah, what's the address? In Merston, 
as a car far, Warwick Wold, Merston. We're on our way, sir. There'd been a spate of abandoned cars in this area, and this witness was compiling a video of them. John Shippey's body was found in the boot of his burnt-out Sierra. He died from stab wounds. These are identical glasses to the ones he was wearing. They're Cephalo sporting glasses. They're missing, as is this watch, which is uh, a fairly distinctive Seiko watch. So if you've seen these uh, abandoned somewhere, and John Beavis, the cases, we saw him putting identical cases to these into the back of his blue Sierra Sapphire, the cases are missing too. Yes, they are. Um, he kept all his personal and uh, business papers in these uh, cases, and he wouldn't go anywhere without them. The larger one is a Samsonite, hard grey plastic. The other one is a maroon leather case, both with combination locks. I would very much like to know where those cases are. Now, let's just fix dates in people's minds. This is 10 days before Christmas. It was a bitterly cold night that, uh, that Sunday night. Certainly. Sunday morning, there would have been a very heavy frost on the car. Now, there was this three, four days between uh, his last sighting and the discovery of the car. So somewhere, that blue Ford Sierra Sapphire went uh, during that period. It must have been garaged somewhere, left out on the streets. It, it's critical to our investigation. We must know where that car was. It was certainly somewhere for those three days. H613CWS, as you can see. Where do you think it probably was? What sort of area? I would say it was in eastern Surrey, uh, north west Kent, maybe south London, Croydon, those sort of areas. Uh, it may have been outside a lockup. Someone may have seen it obstructing their driveway. We really must find out where that car was for those three days. Now, there was an implication, as we, as we saw in the reconstruction, that he had an appointment on the Sunday. Yes, despite all the people we've seen, and we've seen um, numerous members of his close associates and business asso acquaintances, um, nobody has mentioned having that appointment with him on that Sunday, and I would very much like to hear from anybody who's made arrangements to meet John on that Sunday, the, the 15th of, de of December. We heard how he sort of compartmentalised his, his life. I mean, do, do you think you've now spoken to everybody who knew him? No, he was a very complex character indeed, and in fact the, the way he compartmentalised his life has made my inquiry even more difficult. Um, I w there's possibly parts of his life now uh, that we haven't actually entered into, and uh, if anybody out uh, who's listening to this programme who knew John Shippey, was a girlfriend of John Shippey, had business dealings with John Shippey, who we haven't spoken to, please contact us. Just, uh, it's a bit of a long shot, this, but three canisters like this, camping canisters, canisters of gas, butane gas, were what detonated that explosion in the car. Now, each of them has serial numbers on the bottom, and the three in the back of the car, the serial number's 00491, and if you sold those to somebody, before Sunday the 15th of December. Remember anything about them? 00491, do please give us a call. Mr. Beavis and his colleagues are, are waiting for anybody who's got any information. Here's the number, 81 Remember, if you prefer, you can speak to a BBC researcher. Or you can call Rygate Police Station direct. That's on 0737 765 040. That's 0737 765 040. Crime Watch doesn't make appeals for missing persons. If someone chooses to make off without telling family or friends, well, you know, it may be reckless, selfish, thoughtless of the worry that they'll have caused, but it's not a crime. Tonight, though, I'm asking one person, please call home. Dinah McNichol, if you're watching, will you call your father, your grandma, or Sarah? All of them are waiting by the phone right now. All they want to hear is that you're alive and well. The fact is that Sergeant Derek Nicholl here fears that Dinah has been abducted and may be dead. Dinah's family and friends and one of her teachers have taken part in our reconstruction of the days that led up to her disappearance. None of them has seen her since she went to a rock festival last August. And with the festival season due to start again soon, this appeal is aimed especially at anyone who saw Dinah last year. Everything going then? It's going really great, actually. I'm getting on really well with Dad, which is great. Before she vanished, Dinah was in good spirits. 
She'd finished her A-levels and had told her father she'd spend the summer unwinding, maybe traveling. In 1980, her mother was killed in a traffic accident. She was forced to grow up rather quickly. Um, maybe go to India or somewhere. She did admire what her sister had done, and uh, her elder sister, and she wanted to do some sort of thing like uh, do all the studies, get her A-levels, and uh, go to college or university. Dinah had been quiet but self-composed at school and was expected to do well, especially by her history teacher, Paul Luxmore. Her background um, and difficulties in childhood, I think, gave her a greater experience than other, other pupils had. Um, and she was therefore often the person who other pupils turned to for help. This is a rock festival at Deptford in southeast London. On the 27th of July, this film was taken by one of Dinah's friends. Next day, Dinah hitched home, and not far from her old school, was spotted by her former teacher. I was driving through East Essex on a Sunday afternoon and saw Dinah walking on the side of the road. Um, she was instantly recognisable as Dinah because of her hair and the clothes that she was wearing. So I pulled in and offered her a lift. I knew that she often hitchhikes and she's quite a long way from home. Um, so it, it seemed to make sense to, to offer her a lift back. During the course of the conversation, I told Dinah that, that the following weekend I'd be going down to Chichester. She asked me if she could have a lift down. She was going to a festival in Liphook in Hampshire, which is nearby. I agreed to do that because otherwise I knew that, that she'd be hitchhiking down. <laughs> On her 18th birthday, Dinah became entitled to £2,000. It was compensation for her mother's death. Dinah put it in a building society and then resisted all temptation to draw on it. Why don't you take some money out of your account? No, I don't want to touch that money. I want to save that for university because I'm not an yeah. We'd spent a week at my nan's, Shona, Dinah and myself, and we'd had a good week doing things like playing crazy golf and going swimming and shopping. I dropped her off at High Barnet Tube Station after lunch on Friday. Oh, well, thanks for the lift. That's OK. And uh, take care, all right? Yeah, anyway. oh. I'll see you soon. Yeah, see you again. And as I watched her go, I felt very protective and a strong feeling of love for her. And I thought about getting out the car to give her a, a hug goodbye but I didn't, and that was the last time that I saw her. Next day, as arranged, Paul Luxmore dropped Dinah off near the festival at Liphook in Hampshire, where she'd planned to meet with friends. Oh, thanks for the lift. You're welcome. See ya. Cheers. Take care. I will. Dinah seems to be perfectly happy and relaxed that day. There's nothing unusual about her. Um, she seemed to be pleased to have been over with her exams and with her life ahead of her. But she certainly wasn't the sort of person who'd be taken in by anybody. She wasn't gullible at all um, and seemed to give me the impression that after going to the festival, she'd be going straight home afterwards. Dinah spent that evening chatting and listening to the music. <coughs> Next day, Sunday the 4th of August, the Torpedo Festival, as it was called, wound down. Um, yeah, I was thinking, I, I don't think I'm going to come back with you. I um, might hitch down to Portsmouth. Why Portsmouth? Well, why not really? It's not that far away and I've never been. Um, I'm going to leave my stuff here and I'm going to go off for a while. I'll see you back a bit later. All right, All right. It was about two and a half hours later when Dinah returned from her walk. Look, I'm sorry it's been so long, but as I said before, I'm going to hang around here as long as possible and then I'm going to hitch down to Portsmouth. So I'll see you in a couple of weeks or so. Dinah did introduce us to the man that she was with, but I can't remember his name. She did say that she just met him. He was in his mid-twenties, about five foot nine inches tall, of medium build, casually dressed with wavy dark hair. Next morning, in nearby Greyshot, a villager remembers a couple who were walking down the high street. The woman seemed quite young and short, 
in fact Dinah's only four foot ten, the man was maybe ten years older. Dinah's exam results arrived soon after she disappeared. She passed them all. She'd almost certainly get into university. There's no way she would not let us know that uh, she was OK. And uh, we really fear the worst. Derek Nicholl, so do you, don't you? Yes, we do. We are treating this really seriously. The search we done earlier this year at Bramshop Common uh, was undertaken by Hampshire Constabulary with over 100 police officers over a three-day period. So as far as you're concerned now, this is effectively a murder hunt? It is. We can't call it a murder hunt at this stage because obviously we haven't found a body, but we are desperately concerned and we do feel that there is a strong possibility that something has happened to her. Now, one of the, the clues is that that £2,000 that she got as compensation for, for her mother's death, that she, she guarded so carefully, all of that has been withdrawn. With the exception of about hundred odd pounds yes, it was withdrawn at 13 locations around the south coast uh, between the 8th and the 25th of August of last year, uh, as wide a part as Ramsgate, Margate, Haven, Brighton. That's all pretty ominous. Yes. Um, the chap she was seen with as she left Ramshot Common uh, on the Sunday, the 4th of August, I mean, he's by no means likely to be uh, the murderer. I mean, you just need to get hold of him just to find out where she went next. Indeed, we would desperately like to talk to that young man. Um, as you say, he may not be involved at all, but he would be the person that can give us a clue as to where she went if she left that festival site. He's, he's 25 upwards, we think. Five foot nine, we think. We honestly don't know a great deal more about him. The only thing that is distinctive about him is that he was casually dressed at what was extensively a hippie festival, and that is the only thing the young girl was with her can remember particularly. Just clutching at straws, just assuming that Dinah is still alive and just gone off, so maybe she's joined some sort of sect or something like that. We have looked into that. It is a very difficult area to look at, but from the character and everything I know about her and discover from her friends, she is not the sort of person they believe anyway to be taken in by one of these sorts of things. She wore contact lenses and actually she was very, very short-sighted, wasn't she? She was indeed. In fact, uh, to coin a phrase, she needed glasses to find her glasses. So if any optician has... Uh has seen her. Again, it's a heck of a long shot, but I mean, there were minus 10 or minus 11.5. One, one was minus 10 and one was a mi minus 11.5. Any other help that anybody can give? Uh, at the moment, we have no idea where she went or what happened to her after her friends left her at Branshock Common. OK. Well, it was uh, Sunday the 4th of August. Very, very hot time last year. If you saw her, please call us. Incidentally, if someone close to you is missing, don't call us. You might like to call the Missing Person Helpline, though, set up by the, set up by the Susie Lamplew Trust. There's a the number, 081 392 2000. 081 392 2000. Coming back to the Dinah McNichol inquiry, the number here in the studio is 081 811 8181. Or if you think you know anything at all, you can try the instant room in Chelmsford. That's on 0245. 542120-0245-452120. And we've had an important development on one of the reconstructions. That was the case of the missing 18-year-old Dinah McNichol. You may remember some friends last saw Dinah with a man that she'd met at a rock festival in Hampshire last August. The only hope police had of discovering what had happened to Dinah was for that man to come forward. And four days after our programme, he did get in touch. Detectives are in no doubt that this man has had nothing to do with Dinah's disappearance and he has been able to take their inquiries several stages further. The man remembers that on the Monday after the festival, he and Dinah decided to hitchhike home. It was early in the afternoon when a motorist offered them a lift. He picked us up from a petrol station on the A3. I thought that it could have been a Vauxhall Viva at one point. Possibly olive green or some similar shade of light green. I thought it was probably between eight and nine years old. Oh, that concert was brilliant, wasn't it? I mean, I've never as been far as I can remember, the driver had sort of straw-coloured, wavy hair between 35 and 45. 
He asked the driver to drop him at junction 8 on the M25, the Rygate turn-off, leaving Dinah in the car. See you then. Bye. I was definitely under the impression that she was going home. Dinah gave me a telephone number when I was getting out the car, and uh, I phoned her up, but there was never anybody in. Well, Dinah's home is in Tillingham in Essex, which is a good 80 miles away from Rygate. So the crucial question now is what happened to Dinah after that? If that motorist was you, or you know who he is, or if you know anything about where Dinah may have gone next, remember we're talking about August last year, please do call us. More detectives have been drafted into the incident room, and it is now being treated as a full-scale murder investigation. The number here to the studio is 081 811 8181. And our lines are open now. Now, police are depending on Crime Watch viewers tonight to help them make sense of a murder. Jacqueline Palmer Radford was well liked. She lived with her two sons in the Hampshire village of Eversley near Reading, and her life really revolved around the children. Eleven weeks ago, she was found dead at her home. Jacqueline's sons are played and are filmed by actors and have been given fictitious names. Our reconstruction begins in Eversley on Tuesday, the 31st of March, the day before her death. Do you need any help with your homework tonight, Sam? Yeah, that'd be great. Jacqueline and her husband separated a year and a half ago after 18 years of marriage. She and her two sons, 17-year-old Sam and 6-year-old James, had continued to live in the family home, Riversdale House. So what do you two fancy for dinner tonight, then? The Sanya or pizza again? Pizza, pizza! <laughs> Is that all right with you, Sam? It's the second time this week. We were always very close, uh, simply because she, there was no one else with her. The most in important thing with Jacqueline were the children. Uh, she'd worry all the time for them, making sure they had plenty of clothes, uh, getting their day right from uh, the start. Since her separation, Jacqueline had taken up new interests in her life. She applied for an open university course and became involved in a number of sports. She was socialising more and widening her circle of friends. So do you think you're going to take up tennis then? Or? Well, I, I quite fancy it, but I think it's going to take up too much time, really. Mm. I'd known Jacqueline for about, about 18 months. We were very close. I think we sort of regarded each other as best friends and we used to confide in each other a lot uh, if there were problems or if there was anything bothering her, she used to phone me. On the day before she died, Jacqueline, as usual, collected James from his school in Crowthorn, four miles away. At around that time, on the opposite side of the road from where the parents normally park, one of the mothers remembers a man in a dark brown hatchback car, possibly a Vauxhall Chevette. The man didn't seem to be watching the school gates. He seemed tense and serious, staring straight ahead of him. Sam? Come on, you're going to be late. Your breakfast is on the table. I knew he shouldn't have stayed up to watch that film. Mum, oh, have you seen that assignment I was working on last night? Yes, you left it on the floor. I've put it in your college bag. Oh, now who can that be? Hello? Oh, hi, Mum. Look, I can't talk now. I'm in a bit of a rush. Yes, we're running late this morning. OK, fine. I'll call you later. Yep, bye. A few hundred yards along the road from Riversdale House is a small office block. The main road through the village is a clear way, and employees arriving for work at about half past eight that morning remember seeing a stranger in their small car park. Maybe she's a new temp. No, she doesn't start till tomorrow. The first thing I noticed was her green scarf, which was covering most of her hair. She made me think that she didn't want to be recognised. Jacqueline would have driven past the car park as she took James to school just before nine o'clock. Ten minutes after that, Chris Gaylor drove through the village. I was on my way to work in uh, Reading. As I came into Eversley, there was a, a brown Chevette type car stopped in front of a house indicating right, but there was no oncoming traffic. I waited behind the, 
MacArthur, 10 to 20 seconds. He then turned into the, the driveway. As I looked up the drive, there was um, a stone drive with a couple of garages at the end. There was no cars in the driveway. No one saw the car leave Jacqueline's driveway. Was it there when she returned from the school run 10 minutes later? Her mother remembers she sounded her usual self on the phone. Well, actually, I'm going shopping. I've got to go and buy James a new jacket. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I could try that new shop. Later that morning, the beige car was still parked outside the office block. I noticed the same car in a different parking space. The lady was still in the car, but she'd taken the scarf off her head. She was very, very pale. Red or ginger, short hair. I got the impression that she was very slim. She seemed to be parked outside until at least mid-morning. At about midday, someone saw a smartly dressed man with a clipboard outside Riversdale House. There were plans to sell the house, although it wasn't yet on the market, but perhaps this was an estate agent or a surveyor. He may have seen something significant. At four o'clock, James was still waiting for Jacqueline to collect him from school. Come on, James. Mummy's not here yet. Should we go and tell her? At about half past five, Jacqueline was found in her home. She'd been suffocated. This is such a sad case. Mr Long, perhaps we could start with the brown hatchback car, which was seen turning into Jacqueline's driveway. Do you think it's the same one that was seen the day before outside the school? It's possible. The driver at the house may have been a male. Certainly the man at the school was definitely a male. Uh, we have a photo fit of that man. He's described as 40 years, uh, sandy coloured hair, mid-brown, scruffy on the top, um, wearing a white shirt over a grey pullover. He had a particularly pale complexion and looked ill. Right. Now what about the woman in the beige car? Very important we trace that person. Anybody that would know the identity or the make of the vehicle or knows anyone that's loaned or hired a vehicle that description to such a person, I'd like to know. Right. Remember, we're going back to the end of March or the beginning of April. There was the man with the clipboard in the afternoon which just might tie in with a pen you found in Jacqueline's driveway. Yes, yeah, fairly common and pen that retails for about 30, 32 pounds in most outlets. It's a shaper pen with a, a, a zigzag design on it. Yes. Something we didn't see in the film, at about 11 o'clock in the morning, a man was seen running near Jacqueline's home. He was about 300 yards away, a rather unusual man, wearing a raincoat, jogging bottoms, training shoes, carrying a plastic Sainsbury's bag and another bag that looked like an airline bag. If simply, you saw him, you'd remember. Yes, simply like to know who he is. Mm. And someone, uh, something else not in the film, we... Um, in Jacqueline's house, you found an open university prospectus with a name on it, Lawrence Gillam, and a time, perhaps, so it looks like 10.40. That's quite correct. Uh, the importance of that, she might very well have had an appointment, somebody. We'd like to know who Mr Gillam is. Please, if you can help, please call us. The number's 081 811 8181 here, or you can call the Basingstoke Police Station direct, and that number's 0256 473 111. That's 0256, the code for Basingstoke, 473 one, one. First, a notorious crime that two months ago made headlines all over Britain. On Wimbledon Common in southwest London, a young mother, Rachel Nickell, was waylaid and repeatedly stabbed. Her scratched and bruised two-year-old son was found clinging to her body. It appears to be a random killing, which of course makes it extremely hard to solve. So tonight, detectives are putting all their cards on the table and they're appealing for the whole nation's help to name the killer. The appeal is in two parts. First, for crucial witnesses, some of whom have yet to be traced. Second, an appeal to the killer's mother or friends or family. In the next few minutes, Superintendent John Bassett is going to reveal everything that's known about the murderer, including a great deal that's never been reve revealed before. Someone watching must be able to piece the clues together. This is an area known as the mound. Behind it is the main A3. And south of the mound is where Rachel walked that morning with her son and the dog romping off ahead of her. Just in front of her is a path that leads to a bridleway. This is her path seen from the air, and this, marked with an X, is where she met her killer. First, the hunt for the remaining witnesses, most of whom have come forward, people on the common. Yes. 
You still think there are others? Oh, yes. I, I think there are a number of witnesses who have yet to come forward. In fact, as late as Friday, a very important witness was seen by us. So there are more to come forward. And not just on the common, but I know in the cemetery to the, to the west of it, and also north of the A3 towards Putney and Roehampton. Yes, that's right. Uh, there was a witness seen north of the A3 uh, running towards the Roehampton estate. Uh, he was a man dressed just in blue boxer shorts that morning and had a bundle of clothing under his arm. We don't think he's involved, but we'd like to eliminate him from the inquiry. OK, so if that was you, it may not be a very flattering picture of you, but please do call us straight away. OK, now to uh, identify the killer. Remember the date, Wednesday the 15th of July. This is what we know so far. A mother and her two teenage sons saw a man here by the curling pond. Now, that was about quarter past ten. It's about 15 minutes before Rachel was murdered. It's five minutes walk from here to the murder scene. The murder scene, again, marked with a cross. The man was in his 20s or 30s. He was tall, more than 5 feet 10, and had short brown hair. He had a white shirt with buttons and dark trousers, possibly blue, and was carrying a small, dark bag. Curiously, his belt was over his shirt rather than round his trousers. Or perhaps it was a dog lead. He seemed to bend forward slightly as he walked. Was he trying to hide his face? The family who saw him were suspicious because they had the impression he was following a woman. Now, that woman was the one who was traced on Friday. She thought the man was probably on his way to work, but a few minutes later, about 20 past 10, he reappeared back by the pond. No one saw him go down south on the open ground towards the mound, but if he took this path, it would lead him through the trees towards Rachel Nickell. Now, if that was you and you didn't head down here and didn't encounter Rachel, you're nonetheless a key witness. Now is the time to call 081 811 8181. Then perhaps three minutes after the murder, a man was seen here. He too looked suspicious because he turned his face from the witness as though he didn't want to be seen. And he seemed to crouch down as though he was trying to wash himself. Indeed, there is a small stream here. Rachel's killer would certainly have her blood on him. This man too was in his late 20s or early 30s. He was tall, maybe six feet, and he too had short brown hair. He wore a light top and loose-fitting jeans or trousers. Again, he was carrying a dark bag. Again, if it was you and you had nothing to do with the murder, call us now, 081-811-8181. Now, from this point, let's add some informed conjecture. A consultant clinical psychologist has been handed evidence of Rachel's murder, and he's been comparing its hallmarks with other psychopathic killings. He's drawing up a likely profile of the killer, and though it won't be completed until next week, his official guidance is already as follows. The killer is under the age of 30. He lives locally. He still lives at home with his mum or parents or alone in a hostel or a bedsit. He's untidy and disorganised. It's possible he has a bike, but he probably doesn't drive a car. He's a low achiever, so he's never done well at exams. He's not very good at conversation. He has few friends and has solitary hobbies. He may have an interest in martial arts. He likes pornography, including some of the violent sort. He doesn't have a steady girlfriend. If he's had previous girlfriends, they'll have found him unsatisfying, sexually inexperienced, and wanting to act out domineering gameplay. He's pestered women before. Indeed, he may have been caught for minor sex offences. He may well have an unskilled job, though if he does, remember, he certainly had that Wednesday morning off back in mid-July. His family will know that something's wrong with him, but they'll obviously find it hard to admit, even to themselves. They'll have noticed his mood changed after mid-July. He was upset or excitable for a few days after that. Above all, he could cause a tragedy and suffering like this again. Now, remember, some of these guidelines could be wrong, but if you can put several clues together and they fit someone you know, we all know the importance of this. Please do call us. John Bass, it's, it's going to be so difficult for a family, whatever their suspicions to ring. I mean, to, to imagine that someone close to them, or a girlfriend, someone that close to them at some stage could have done this. Yes, it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, but I would appeal to the females of the Wimbledon area uh, to come forward and identify this man. He is a local man, and I believe a mother, sister, or girlfriend knows the identity of this man. Um, women have an instinct for, for men that are odd like this. This man is dangerous, 
and he's ill and he needs attention. I know most unusually in this case for witness, just for this program, you have sought from the Crown Prosecution Service and achieved a guarantee of immunity from yes. anybody who's involved in minor offences. Yes, right. What about confidentiality, promising that families won't, won't be involved? Well, in... I, I can promise uh, any family that rings me that their identity will never be revealed uh, and they can have complete confidence in myself and my team. Can I repeat, I mean, friends and family, of course, will always have a sense of disbelief, but it's easy to eliminate people who are innocent. It's a matter of life and death to find a man who's guilty. So if you've even the slightest hunch, please call. Could I add, the killer himself, according to these psychologists, may be deeply troubled by what he's done. He may not be able to understand it or explain it, but he can put himself in a position where people can help him and make sure he's not the cause of further tragedy. All it takes is a phone call. If you have any information, please call. You can ask to speak to a woman if you prefer, and there are BBC researchers here too. Or you can call the incident room in Wimbledon, that's on 081-947-1212. Please persevere if you find any of these numbers busy. Wimbledon 1 again, 081-947-1212. Our last reconstruction tonight is the murder of 18-year-old Kate Ratcliffe. She'd been out dancing with friends at a popular club in Camberley in Surrey. At the end of the evening, through a misunderstanding which turned out to be tragic, Kate's friends left for home without her. A few hours later, Kate was dead. Now, why was she killed and by whom? Was it by some stranger who saw her by chance out walking in the small hours? Or perhaps had somebody followed her from the club? Police badly need your help. Our reconstruction begins at the hairdressing salon where Kate was a trainee. Kate had worked at Bumbles 2 for nearly two years. No, I go on Saturday actually. Should be quite fun. I'm going to Batlins. Uh, Alison Glover, who runs the salon, remembers Kate with great affection. Kate came to the salon two years ago, straight out of school. She was always very friendly and willing to help and do anything that she could possibly do. She had a great enthusiasm for the job. She was happy, happy go lucky everyday teenager. Kate lived two miles away in Hawley with her parents and older sister, Joanne. Kate was my only sister. She loved going out, she loved dancing, she had a lot of friends, she loved her job. She was just a normal 18-year-old, happy-go-lucky girl. Where's my jacket? Is it ready? Which one? My blue one. Oh, it's in there. There you go. Got it. Kate and her best friend Michelle always went out on a Saturday night. Mm. Got to change this music. Well, not now. I've only just put it on. Oh, we've listened to loads of yours. Anyway, this is better. Kate and Michelle often went to Ragamuffins in Camberley. It's a popular nightclub in an indoor shopping precinct. This Saturday, they arrived there shortly before nine o'clock. They'd arranged to meet some other friends there. Thanks, Scott. I want to go and dance, though. Come on, Michelle, come and dance. Ooh. Come on. There's hardly anyone down there. Don't worry about it. Come on, come dance. Several people at the club noticed a man in his mid-twenties standing alone at one end of the dance floor. He was dressed entirely in black and he stood staring silently at the dancers throughout the night. Who was he? During the evening, Kate met a former boyfriend, Metin. They'd ended their relationship some six months ago, but Kate was still very fond of him. Oh, mine. It's just on the top there somewhere. Is he still with Dom? Yeah. Boy's not out, isn't it? So... As closing time approached, the lone man was still standing in the same place. There were 516 people at Ragamuffins that night. Police have spoken to all except 33 of them. If one of those is you, we need to hear from you. No one saw Kate leave the club. She probably went when the music finished around 2 o'clock. Assuming she'd left with Metin, her friends didn't worry about her. 
In fact, he'd left before her. Police believe she went outside searching for him. A few streets away from the club, a witness was waiting up for his son. The van was a blue transit board van. He had short cropped brown hair, was aged between 20, 20 and 24 and had a moustache. He was clearly lost. Back at the precinct, Kate had returned to ragamuffins. She seemed to be looking for someone. She was clearly upset. Someone's sitting in front of the uh, nightclub door. Kevin, could you get a move for us, please? Could you uh, also inform the young lady that it's 2.30 and we've got to lock the doors as well? As soon as I saw her, I realised it was the young lady that you were talking about on the radio. I was waiting to lock up and she was one of the last to leave. I asked her to use the automatic doors. But she walked straight past, and I had to unlock the door to let her out. You got a cigarette, please? Yeah. I saw her walk two or three yards outside the doors and stop. She just stood there, and after I locked up, I remember logging down the time. It was 2.30. It's always busy outside the precinct as ragamuffins turns out. But within half an hour or so, the area is almost deserted. One of the few people still around was an acquaintance of Kate's, Philip Williams. I could see Kate was on her own, and she was obviously upset. I kept asking her how she was. She didn't reply. I got the impression she was looking for a friend met him. An hour after that, and four miles away, another witness saw a blue transit van. Roxanne Jameson was on her way home. I remember leaving work early in the hours of Sunday. It was about half past two when I left, and I got to Farnborough about quarter past three. I drove down the Union Street and to the Prospect Road junction, where the traffic lights were red, so I had to wait. The blue transit van came hurtling around the corner from underneath the bridge. I did try to look for the driver, but I didn't see the driver or the registration plates. Just 200 yards away from that junction, at 8 o'clock that Sunday morning, Kate's body was found. She'd been fatally stabbed. I can't begin to understand why anybody would want to hurt Kate. She, she didn't have any enemies. She was a very popular girl. Um, I miss her. We all miss her a great deal. Um, if there is anybody out there that can, can help, please, just come forward. Well, from Hampshire Police, Mr. Bugard is here to take the calls. How, first of all, do you think that Kate got from Camberley to Farnborough, four or five miles away? Well, it had to be by transport of some sort, a car or a van. Uh, and we're still very interested in any sightings of her, either talking to the driver of such a vehicle or getting into a vehicle. Mm. And how important do you think those two sightings of a blue transit van are? Quite an old van. They, they, could, be they could be important. I mean, in different areas they've been seen, um, but um, the one in Park Row, we do have this photo fit of this man, which uh, yeah. does help us um, ask the person who was driving that to come forward. Um, mm. The other one, by the very nature of the driving, they would probably recognise them as the driver. And you had a recent sighting, a first sighting of a blue transit van in the right area at the right time? Yes, we did. In the, in the recent days, in the taxi rank outside of Camberley Railway Station, um, could well be uh, a similar vehicle. So more in blue transit vans would be useful. Right. You're offering complete confidentiality on the, to the remaining 33 people at the club that night. One detail we didn't mention in the film is that the lone man standing at one end of the hall had very distinctive boots on. Yes, black crocodile boots with silver toe caps. I would have thought that would ring a distinctive bell with certainly with the individual and possibly with other customers. Mm. And just to remind you, the date is the early hours of Saturday the 6th of June and Sunday the 7th of June. So if that was you, please do ring us tonight. Finally, the jacket that Kate wore that night has disappeared. This is one very similar. This is a similar jacket. Uh, the only thing to recognise is that the bottom button on the left-hand side is, was missing off her jacket. If you notice anyone you know behaving strangely after the 6th of June, if you have any information at all that can help Dennis Bogard and his colleagues, 081-811-8181 is the number here in the studio, or you can phone the incident room in Aldershot, and that's 0252 24545. That's 0252, the code for Aldershot, 24545. Well, our first case tonight is one that made headline news in August. Guests at a wedding party in Horndean in Hampshire 
discovered the body of 15-year-old schoolgirl Helen Gorry in the grounds of Murchiston Hall Community Centre, only minutes from where she lived. There are several witnesses in the area who remember seeing girls who looked like Helen shortly before her death. So the task now, with your help hopefully, is to establish exactly what did happen that night. Helen was a sociable girl with lots of friends. She loved being out and about. But more than anything else, she loved spending her time with children and wanted to be a nanny when she left school. Helen lived on an estate nearby with her stepbrother and her mother, Sheila. She was a typical teenager, typical 15-year-old. She loved her music, loved dancing, adored babies, and babies adored her. Very bubbly. She had a great sense of humour and personality that everybody loved. I don't think she had an enemy in the world. <laughs> On the night Helen died, she'd spent the later part of the evening at home with her brother Jamie. What are you making? Cheese sandwich. Make me one. Take your own. Sorry. Want some cornflakes? No thanks. Ten minutes walk away from the house is the local community centre, Murchiston Hall, where on a Friday night there are all kinds of social activities. Our eyes on one another, didn't you, dear? And perhaps I should have mentioned hands off. Dean Amateur Theatrical Society were rehearsing a play there that evening. It's now about half past eleven. I borrowed a video. Do not watch it? No, I'll watch it later. I'm going to go up now. But a few minutes later, she was back downstairs again. Oh, I won't be long. Where are you going? I won't be long. It wasn't unusual for Helen to go out this late. A lot of her friends lived nearby. Sometimes they called for her. Or she might have seen someone she knew from an upstairs window and gone out to meet them. This is the old A3, or Portsmouth Road, at the junction with Catherington Lane. The main road runs past Murchiston Hall. At about 10 to midnight, 20 minutes after Helen left home, a local man saw a girl fitting Helen's description standing in a bus shelter on the Portsmouth Road. At the same time, a car, possibly an escort, came up from Catherington Lane. A passing motorist, Patricia Longyear, also saw the girl getting into the car. But then further along the road, she saw someone else who looked like Helen with two men. The two men were of opposite appearance. The larger one of the two seemed to be overweight, casually dressed, red hair shining in the light. The other was slighter built, very smart. Clearly one of those girls wasn't Helen. So if one of them was you, please call. Come on, James. Yeah. By this time, Murchiston Hall had closed, but there were still groups of people in the grounds. At around midnight, Sheila Good was driving past the hall along the Portsmouth Road. As I was driving along, a man came out of the bushes. I got the impression that um, he didn't want me to see his face. Some half an hour later, Roger Woods was driving along the same stretch of road. He remembers two men standing several yards apart, but he had the impression they were together. One man in particular caught his attention. What made him stand out is uh, the way he was looking at me, as much to say, oh God, somebody's spotted us. Police believe it may have been around this time that Helen was killed. Her body was discovered the following day. She'd been asphyxiated. So appeals on several sightings there, and several sightings of girls looking like Helen that night, which is a problem for you, really. Yes, it is, and clearly all the sightings cannot be Helen. So we would ask, if you are one of those girls, please come forward and help us to eliminate you. If uh, the girl with the ginger-haired man is Helen, of course, then he is of particular significance to this inquiry. And if not, of course, we need to eliminate them from the inquiry. Yes, sir. Now, there's somebody else you need to hear from. On the Monday after Helen's death, 
a shop assistant at the one-stop supermarket in Catherington Lane, remembers one particular customer. I saw her on the Friday night. She passed me on the street on the corner. It was about half past 12. And I thought, you silly girl, you're only about 15. What are you doing out so late? Have you been to the police? Oh, oh no. You ought to. Well, yeah, I might. Anything helps? <laughs> as soon as I mentioned the police, it was a bit shaky. All you really want to do is just get away from me. Now, that man's important to you. Why? Yeah, he's vital to us. We don't have a, a positive sighting of Helen after 11.30 on that Friday night. We don't know where she went, who she met, or what she did. So anybody who can give us a positive sighting of Helen after 11.30 uh, would be of great interest. And that man in particular seems to have, uh, we thinks he saw her, he needs to come forward to us. Mm. He seemed a bit nervous about contacting the police. You, you can offer him complete discretion. Yes, we can. He can contact us in confidence, and he, he need have no fear about contacting us. Now, Murchison Hall was very busy that night, as we said. Have you talked to everybody who was there that night? It's Friday the 31st of July. We've spoken to a large number of people who were there, but we know that there were teenagers in the grounds of that hall up until midnight. They have not come forward. It's essential that they do. And again, I'm not concerned why they were in the grounds of the hall, I'm concerned only with Helen's death, and we need information from them. So please come forward if you were in the grounds of Murchison Hall on that Friday night. Could be vital. A witness has also told you that a blue Ford Fiesta was seen parked in the area. Yes, at about midnight, a metallic blue Ford Fiesta was actually in the grounds of Murchison Hall and may have been associated with two teenage lads who were there. No real description, except they were probably wearing blue jeans. But again, that car could be quite crucial. If you know who the, who the owner of that car is, or if you are the owner of that car, please come forward. Right, well, if you were in Horndean that night, if you saw any of those things, it was late Friday the 31st of, 31st of July and right into the small hours of Saturday the 1st of August. If you think you can help at all, you can ring us here on 081 811 8181 or you can call the Havant Police Station, that's on 0705 321111. That's 0705, the code for Havant, 321111. Does the name... Michael Towler mean anything to you? Michael Towler, that is, from Holly Street in Great Horton in Bradford. Michael was a part-time shop assistant and a charity worker until one Wednesday night in early August he was murdered. This appeal now is naturally focused on the Bradford area and it's aimed in part at men who've had gay contacts there. For there are two things that seem likely about Michael's killer. He might have been one of Michael's homosexual partners and he may well kill someone else. Our reconstruction begins in Shipley, in West Yorkshire. Good morning, Dial Bradford. I'll see, uh, I oh, wonder I'll if we see. ought to do a couple of letters. Could you take one for me? Dial is the Disabled Information Action Line, and Michael helped here several times a month. Uh, I am writing on behalf of the group. I first met Michael about three years ago, and I mainly got to know him through the uh, fundraising committee. He was treasurer, I was secretary. I always found him a kind man, a straightforward man, and a very honest man. If anybody needed anything doing in the street where he lived, he would do it. Michael was always there. Holly Street's a little dead-end road with houses back to back, so you go through an alley, sometimes called a ginnel, to reach Michael Towler's door. It's the sort of place where everyone knows everyone. I've known Michael 20 years and I've been here 22 and we made friends. We used to call in quite regularly for a cup of tea and the chat. Hello. If he didn't want a cup of tea, we'd have the chat. Oh, Margaret, how are you? Hello, Michael. I'm all right. He used to do jobs for me. But they were always willing to help. What have you been up to while I've been away? Nothing. It's been very quiet. I knew Michael was a homosexual. And it never made any difference with any of us on the street. On Wednesday, the 5th of August, Julie Walsh, one of Michael's neighbours, was watching the Olympics with her boyfriend and her son. They were waiting for the finals of the women's hurdles. Billy, 
turn the telly down. Mike is having an argument with somebody. What's he saying? I don't know. Turn it down. Uh, this is a monster. I knew it was Michael's voice, but I don't actually know who was shouting at. I never saw anybody. I just thought it were kids in the garden messing about. This time they go. Hemmings very slowly away in lane number seven. Sally Gunnell's gone very quickly. Good, good. Michael's argument couldn't have lasted long because half an hour later he was chatting calmly to a friend. But he was clearly finding this a trying evening. Yeah, right. Go on. Hey! This is private property. If you come back again, I'll call the police. Whoever he was angry with that evening is an important witness. Please call us now if it was you. Sorry about that. No, uh, where were we? Two hours later, a couple from just down the street were going out. Hi, Michael. Hello. Michael looked as though he was waiting. Was he waiting for you? Mary Barber lives next door to Michael. I was in my bedroom and I heard a knock at the door when I looked out of the window. There was nobody stood on my doorstep, so I just presumed it was somebody knocking on Michael's door. That was 10 o'clock. Into... Downstairs, an hour later, Mary's son, Scott, was settling down to a late supper. Could hear Michael's telly on next door, it was quite loud. First of all, it was just telly on, and then I started hearing noises. You could hear somebody talking, I couldn't hear what they were saying, it was mumble and I couldn't actually tell it whether it was Michael or not. And I just listened for a few seconds and then thought, well, what else of it? The Hare and Hounds pub is round the corner from Michael's house. At a quarter to midnight, this couple were heading home when someone caught their eye. Look at that guy up there, what's he doing? I saw this man with a white jumper on and he was just looking all about himself and he looked a bit strange and that. Was this the killer or could it have been you? When we turned round onto Beacon Road, he started running across Beacon Road up um, Back Street onto Holly Street and then we came along Beacon Road and I looked back to see if I could see him come out of Holly Street and I saw a white um, Sierra with a man bending down, putting some in care. Again, could this be you? Or was this the killer who'd stolen Michael's video? Next day, no one in Holly Street saw Michael. He missed two appointments and didn't answer calls. <coughs> he was discovered with multiple stab wounds, lying dead on his living room floor. This is the same sort of video that was stolen from Michael Towler's home. It's an old uh, Toshiba. Its model number is V55B, but you won't find that on the front anywhere. It's only written in a small thing on the back. It has no remote control. And incidentally, on Michael's video, there's probably no flap here. Have you bought one like this or seen one since uh, early August? Do you know who's acquired one since then, particularly in the Bradford area? If it's a different video, it'll be easy to eliminate. The police are only interested in finding Michael's killer, so please don't be embarrassed about calling however a video was acquired during that period since August. 0818118181. And please don't be embarrassed about calling with information if you've had gay relationships and don't want them revealed, but think you nonetheless have information. Police here have promised to be utterly discreet. Jeremy Clark from Gallup Gay London Policing is taking calls and will help to reassure people that any sensitive information won't be divulged to anyone and won't be kept after the inquiry is over. There are 20 lines here to the studio or you can call direct to the team in Bradford on a free phone number 0800 45 4000. 0800 45 4000. Often on Crime Watch we take on cases that at first seem impossible to solve. In fact, generally, detectives only come to us when their inquiries have drawn a blank. So the programme's one in five success rate is with crimes that are hardest to crack. Even so, our next case must be one of the most difficult we've covered. 
The reason? Well, we're asking men who've been to prostitutes to call and people who've been dealing drugs. The question is, will they care enough about a murder to call in? A lot of people have cared, and so with considerable courage, almost everyone you'll see in our reenactment is the real witness. On a slope at Norred Edge is a beauty spot called Warren Point. It's a half hour drive from Leeds and Bradford, and it's popular with ramblers. I was in the woodland looking for wild fungi that my family and I like to eat. And after about 15 minutes being unsuccessful, I was on my way back to my car and stumbled across the remains of a human being. The body was lying in a natural hollow in the ground over which branches had been placed. It was badly decomposed, but was still identifiably a woman in her early 30s, fully clothed with stab wounds to the chest and back. After two weeks, it was identified as Yvonne Fit. For 10 years, Yvonne worked as a prostitute in Leeds and Bradford. This is Manningham in Bradford, where most other women working on the streets knew Yvonne well. She was one of the few black prostitutes here, but she'd not been seen in Manningham since summer. She'd been arrested more times than members of the vice squad could remember, among them PC Ingrid Cannon. Look, arrest her down there. It's not my turn. I've known Yvonne for some time. She's quite a bubbly sort of a girl. She was always um, full of fun and laughing. She'd never had any nastiness in her or anything like that. But you know that lad on the vice squad? I don't know, I fancy you. I... The sort of brash front that she always put on, um, it did seem to be a bit of a front to me because I think she was uh, quite shy and lonely inside, really. I always got the impression that Yvonne didn't really want to work in the red light area. Um, she was working there just to provide herself the means to live. Despite her lifestyle, Yvonne was still close to her family in Leeds. She was one of seven children. How much are they? She's an eight pound bank. Eight pounds. Sometimes she don't come for sometimes two, three months. And when she does come, she'd turn up with a bundle of flowers, a bunch of flowers. Sometimes three, four bunches. And I always say to Yvonne, I say, Yvonne, don't spend so much money on flowers, you know. And she said, I, she says, Mum, nothing is too much for you. People told me that Yvonne was on the game, that they see her standing about. And when I confronted Yvonne, Yvonne said, oh, no, Mum, there must be mistaken, not me. But by December 1991, things were going badly wrong in Yvonne's life. She'd often taken drugs, but was now heavily addicted to crack cocaine. She was anxious and becoming paranoid. Mm -hmm. Or Thanks. perhaps there was some basis for her fear. You're At any right. rate, she moved to Chapel Town in Leeds yeah. to stay with Alison Drake Lewis. This is really good of you to put me up, you know. Look, any time, OK? But I can't go back to Bradford. There's people there that'll do me in. She was very nervous. She was very right. on edge. I've got into some debt and I owe some money, right? She mentioned on the several occasions that somebody was obviously going to no, find her one no, day. I'm and she was going to come to some harm. Being followed. I'm sure someone's watching me. For five months from last Christmas, Yvonne disappeared. Do you know where she went to live or work? Your call will be treated with the greatest possible discretion. Thank you. Sometime in May, at the Duncan pub in Leeds town centre, Yvonne was back. I'm really depressed and I feel terrible. You don't look right. When Yvonne walked in, I was very shocked. Good morning. It's by my flag. It wasn't the Yvonne that I knew. Anyway, it might be better later. I'm meeting someone. Are you coming back in then? Me and Yvonne were like best mates. If you asked her for it and she had it, she'd give you it. You want to go see a doctor, Yvonne? I'll get a chance, I'll go later. Come on, I'll let yourself go. All right, I'll see you later, Yvonne. Bye, love. Yvonne left at around seven. But three hours later, at 10.15, Gail noticed she was back. She was completely different to what she wore early. She was laughing, she was joking. The man was about five foot five, chubby, white to grey hair, very smartly dressed, and I've never seen him since. This man was seen again with Yvonne two months later. If it was you, or you know who it is, please call. 
Then, in Bradford, in the summer, PC Ingrid Cannon saw Yvonne again. Sometime between June and September, I was driving an unmarked police car along Bertram Road when I saw Yvonne Fick coming in the opposite direction. She was uh, scurrying along a little bit like a frightened rabbit, really, as if she didn't really want to be seen. I was quite surprised to see Yvonne because I hadn't seen her for such a long time, and that's why she caught my attention. It's not known if this really happened, but an anonymous caller rang police to say she'd seen Yvonne being bundled into a green van in Bertram Road. If that was you who called, please ring again. I don't say that I like what she did or nothing, but I mean, it was Yvonne's life and everybody chose the way of life they want. Mm. And nobody had no right taking her life from her. It was hers. Tony Whittle, the people who are most likely to help are likely to be people who are pretty wary of calling in to the programme for pretty obvious reasons. Yes, I mean, right. frankly, if you were out there, would you ring in? Well, I would, and the fact is that many people have contacted us. A number of those have made written statements which they've signed, and they've been very frank about their involvement with Yvonne, both in the drug scene and also in prostitution. Those individuals have had the confidence and the courage to contact us, and I would hope other people would follow that fine example. Of course, you need to find out where she was between January and May. It's pretty critical, that. It is, absolutely. She tended to stay with friends for two or three weeks and then move on, but no one can remember where she was during those crucial months. OK, you want to know if she was in trouble with anyone. Obviously, you want to find out more about that green van, whether that was a hoax call or if that woman was for real. You need her to ring in we certainly do. Again, what would anybody recognise about the assailant? I mean, are there any clues that anybody might, if they've got a suspicions about a man? Yes, there are some. I rather think the person responsible would never have expected the body to be found or identified. In the middle of September, the body was found, and at the end of September, it was identified as Yvonne Fit. That person will have reacted in some way to that discovery, and someone may have picked up on that. OK, well, if you can help in any way, uh, the number here in the studio, 0818 8181, or you can ring the Eccles Hill Police Station. That's direct on a free phone number, 0800 212 392. That's 0800 212 392.